is simultaneously just pleasant for us, uh, but it's also things if you're a facilitator, a therapist, just really simple, easy to remember kind of things. Like you can just be like, hey, nostrils, like to somebody you might be working with, and they might be like, oh, I can like, I can find that point of focus. I can ground down into that. So we'll be doing these kind of mindfulness exercises all throughout as well. Um, but with that, we're going to kind of dive into the first bit of like kind of heady stuff. Um, and this is a section on kind of an updated view of autism. You know, in transparency, a lot of my learnings, a lot of my educating, it's heavily influenced by a lot of autistic PhD scholars who have done their diligence to get all the way through all the academic hurdles and do everything to have their work taken seriously, to be able to advocate in a, in a forum and platform where other people will take it seriously as well. Um, a lot of these ideas are oriented around the neurodiversity principles. And I think they're really important because to get it right out of the way, right away, like this approach that we have with using these psychedelic tools, we're not in the business of like curing anyone of any autism or anything like this. Um, most often we're curing them of like a cultural story that is quite wounding to them oftentimes. And sometimes there's other subtler, more like physiological foundational changes that we're seeing. But in a broad-based sense, uh, acceptance and love and all these cliches are some of the things that come from some of these experiences for these individuals. And if those are present in their caretakers or in their educators to begin with, then like some of that trauma doesn't maybe need to be quite so healed. So we're just kind of putting forth, uh, again, just to really double emphasize the point, we're not trying to cure anything with any of these compounds. Um, while still recognizing that there are a number of individuals, my nephew is one such, who needs constant care, and his parents very much would like for some sort of alleviation of their full-time duties and more kind of independence and agency on his part. There's some early indication based on anecdotal reports that some of these tools can help individuals with self-regulation, kind of getting ahead of their cues, so they can be like, oh, that sensation in my body is that. Like, instead of just memorizing it, they can be like, oh, I'm getting to know my body and what we're in the early phases of calling like neurological rehabilitation, basically. Um, and then if you really want to go deep, you can look at Bill Dolan's work at Hopkins, amazing, which is doing with like social critical period reopening. But short version is we're going to talk about neurodiversity here. <laughs> That's the short version. My brain's a little associative. Um, so we're going to first look at the DSM, Diagnostical Statistical Manual. Uh, so to meet the diagnostic criteria for autism, an individual must have persistent deficits in each of the following three areas of social communication and interaction. And again, uh, this is presented as like a point of contrast to what we'll get to shortly, which is kind of more of like a, a neurodiversity model perspective uh, or a skills-based perspective, if you will. But just so we kind of all know, this was what I was diagnosed through. I took uh, the autism quotient exam and I self-identified with a lot of these traits. It was like affirmed by interviews with others that I had such traits. Um, but if we look down the line, there's deficits in social emotional reciprocity, abnormal social approach, failure of normal back and forth conversation, reduced sharing of interests, emotions, or affect, failures related to initiation or response to social interactions, deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors, total lack of facial expressions and nonverbal communication, Poorly integrated verbal and nonverbal communication, abnormal T's in eye contact and body language, and deficits in understanding and use of gestures. Uh, so again, two out of these three categories, which in also includes deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships, an absence of interest towards peers, difficulties in sharing imaginative play or making friends, and difficulties adjusting behaviors to suit context. So the question here at the bottom reads, might the terms in red be a continuation of the pathologization model? And what might the consequences of uh, identifying with such language be? In other words, if uh, in my case I went to a doctor and was like, I cannot make friends, and the doctor was like, you're right. And I was like, okay, this is terrible. <laughs> like, it was like, it was not an uplifting message to receive. And, 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 and would it instead have been like a, an encouragement to self-inquire into what modes of, of like communication might allow for me to bridge towards others, or what shared interests might I want to discover to have an interest in others, or is there something beyond just spoken language in which I can communicate to others that's going to be deeply connecting for me? Uh, we really try to emphasize just general creativity within this space and reframing what a normal socializing looks like. Uh, I think the internet has done us all a great service in revealing a lot of abnormalities in the world in a wonderful way. I think
think like the Gen Zers are doing a great job of like flying so many amazing prideful flags of so many different kinds of self-expression and neurodivergence is one such thing. It's an odd thing to be like proudly labeled disorderly. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but like the LGBTQ movement was there in the 80s, you know? And some of these things are not immediately mappable because some of these things are hard and fast physiological challenges, things that have known neurobiomarkers. Um, but some of these things are also part of a collective observation of what we consider to be typical or atypical and what we do with that determination ultimately. Um, so it's just consideration of like if we were to go backwards and look at this list and be like differences in social approach, differences in back and forth conversation. A good example of this is like I'm an exceptional lecturer. I'm working on my back and forth com communication still. Uh, but my memory recall, retention, these skills have context, and context can really allow us to thrive or not. Um, so it's a seeking towards that, ultimately, that the neurodiversity paradigm would seek to kind of discover. And also the second part of the DSM definition, which, again, a lot of us maybe who are autistic maybe haven't even like, looked through these definitions to realize like, kind of how reductive they might seem, um, and somewhat subjective as well. Um, but looking at it as uh, at least two of the following four types of restricted or repetitive behaviors, like lining up toys, doing simple motor stereotypes, kind of like referred to within the community as kind of stimming or kind of self-regulating through kind of repetitive movements, things like this, uh, idiosyncratic phrases, uh, and echolalia, which some believe to be potentially uh, an adaptation for retaining information by repeating it to oneself, um, which could be seen as weird, but might be quite assistive to the individual. And if that particular type of behavior is coaxed out of that individual, you might be removing their ad adaptation for retention. Same with sort of self-stimulatory behavior. It might be a way of kind of calming their nervous system down. And if they become just kind of conditioned to remain static, then they might get into like a sort of dissociated sort of state. So a lot of this is deeply somatic work too when we get into some of the psychedelic work as well. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, rigidity of greeting rituals, thinking patterns, difficulty with transitions, taking the same route, eating the same food. Uh, you know, I, my corporate job before this was like systems auditing and all of these things. Like my, it, I leaned into that edge, but in other contexts, that rigidity can be challenging, especially in social contexts where certain amounts of flexibility and like kind of psychological flexibility allow for a bit more social harmony. Some of that rigidity that might serve us in like technical skills trades, things like this. Um, can also be limiting in other containers where a bit of flexibility um, might be assistive. Um, and highly restricted fixated interests, uh, I, like having a special focus or a special interest. Uh, my nephew has a very special interest in Charlie Brown, will never stop talking, probably will never stop talking about Charlie Brown. I never stop talking about the thing I'm lecturing to you guys about, so it's like, what <laughs> context do you go into? And how can you make that leverage? Like, how, like, it's a, there's a comical level of people that are already out there fully functioning in the world with a lot of these trade presentations. The, there's like a sort of joke in our group of like, uh, you know, the people that get diagnosed, the one thing we all have in common as autistic people is that we actually got diagnosed. Like, and beyond that, we're quite different from one another. Um, and so, you know, these things, again, it's all just an emphasis on context. And this DSM definition kind of fixates on the opinion of the observer and kind of strips it away of any context. It's just like normal in a vacuum, or like all these things just kind of exist in a vacuum. Um, so once again, pathology paradigm, which again, the DSM has utility. It's tethered to whether certain people can get insurances, health benefits, it has utility. There's also a great reason to be somewhat critical of how it might set people up. There's already evidence-based research showing uh, that people that receive kind of affirming care, as they call it, uh, you know, the things I talked about, like, let's discover your gifts, let's discover your challenges, let's be honest about this whole thing rather than let's give you a label, thank you. Uh, those people tend to be less suicidal, longer life expectancies, every other health benefit just from feeling seen and heard. Um, so, you know, just remembering that we're, we're all here for the psychedelic interesting part of it, but some of that... Uh, psychedelic part is just kind of bending our own way of thinking about some of these things as well. Um, most especially about the idea of like cures or eliminations. That less than two or three generations ago, there was like legitimate eugenics attempts to eliminate uh, people that are now in this room of that condition. Uh, so it's really triggering to, to think about um, certain kind of angles of approach and where funding is allocated, things like this. 
towards kind of like elimination of uh, of some of these things that are just in a lot of people's views, you know, gifts to the broader intelligence of our of our communities. Um, so it's traditionally dominant uh, in some weird way, and you guys are getting a sense for it now. But oftentimes people show up to be like, "How is this helping with the autism?"s and we're like, "Well, yes, it is on some level." But like, and our, we exist and we get sort of support from like, you know, the FDA or other organizations because we're seeking to alleviate a uh, problem while at the same time kind of trying to contextualize that this problem is not burdened by the individual alone. That there are systemic issues while at the same time an individual is part of that system. And so it's trying to take a more nuanced view. Um, and so on the flip side, um, as I kind of just mentioned it, but um, the stigmatization does have an impact, just marginalization, and um, you know, just limiting uh, like uh, the support. And that if if people, as I did, I sort of didn't believe that there was a path of care, so I proceeded to stop caring about myself, and I couldn't find people that really had answers either. Um, and that is a part of this process too. I think there's a lot of people. For the time being, we're in a weird pocket of time where people go to psychedelics as a last resort. I think ideally, in some near future, we'll start to have more intelligent conversations about preventative psychedelic care, because that's essentially how I live. I check in with myself deeply, internally, often, so I don't get far spun. Um, but for the time being, there's a lot of people that are like, I hope this last option is the thing. Um, so I just want to like, kind of like prepare people for the fact that like perhaps psychedelics might still leave you in a similar place. Like, uh, or that individual that you might be seeking to care, you know, there's perhaps acceptance is like the start and the end of a lot of these journeys for a lot of us, and patience, and all these other cliches, um, while at the same time, you know, we've seen really remarkable changes in, within our community as well, um, but, you know, just trying to not, like, paint any, like, miracle narratives while at the same time kind of honoring the real challenges that people have. Um, so in response to the potential harms of that pathology paradigm, uh, more modern advocates are promoting the neurodiversity paradigm, which is the perspective that views autism and other neurodevelopmental differences like ADHD or even dyslexia as a, sort of a natural form of diversity uh, rather than a pathologized disorder, something that can kind of elicit a new adaptation, a new way of problem solving, um, or a new kind of uh, social uh, issue to address in, in the collective sense. Dr. Nick Walker, you'll hear us mention uh, her work quite often. Uh, Dr. Walker worked on the MAP study with Dr. Alicia Danforth. Uh, they uh, were actually tasked with like updating the definitions to not scare the autistic participants away from participating, because initially it was like basically like, will this MDMA make you less autistic? And people were like, what are you, that doesn't make sense. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't like verbatim that, and like it wasn't like so clunky, but a lot of the research of that era and the initial conception of it was along those lines. And Dr. Walker came in, lived experience and a lot of perspective, wrote a lot of essays on neurodiversity principles. Um, and Dr. Walker put together this definition that was targeted to being consistent with current evidence, not based on the pathology paradigm, concise, simple, and accessible and formal enough for professional and academic use. Um, this is all available through Dr. Walker's site, which I believe is neuroqueer.com. And uh, this definition has also been translated into every language. The target for this definition was to kind of just make an update and just kind of paint nuance. It's like almost disappointingly nuanced in the way that it's like kind of, that's where we are in terms of total understanding. We're not that far as we might seem uh, to think we are. So autism is a genetically based human neurological variant, a complex set of interrelated characteristics that distinguish autistic neurology from non-autistic neurology it is not yet fully understood, but current evidence indicates that the levels of synaptic connectivity and responsiveness are particularly high. This tends to make the autistic individual's subjective experience more intense and chaotic than that of non-autistic individuals. On both the sensory motor and cognitive levels, the autistic mind tends to register more information and the impact of each bit of information tends to be both stronger and less predictable. So I see some heads nodding along of like the autistic people might be like, that seems about right-ish. <laughs> or at least I'll take that over like, I don't know, I'm an abnormal. <laughs> because it's, it's getting at like the root of like the experience and it's also getting at, you know, can we put this person into a certain other environment or like, you know, mode of problem solving where they're gonna thrive my instance of that is like I, I do audio mixing and like the way I'm bombarded by sound in a conference room, I can go and like just like very like surgically like uh, just like pick apart really subtle layers of sound really readily. 
Um, I still have to like wear headphones a lot and things like that just to like survive the city life. But there's ways you can lean on these edges, and it's all about that sort of like skills assessment and discovery. Uh, that's like kind of the first line. Another cliche we say in our group a lot of the time is like modify everything outside of that individual before modifying anything internally, especially like chemistry wise, like psychotropic wise, even psychedelics. If you can solve everything through acceptance and environmental changes, great. That's we're great. <laughs> no one needs intervention at that point. If you're living, if you're living well and you're eating well and, and in a good spot, um, but some of these tools still yet, uh, we believe that there's evidence showing that some of these tools might still be able to go beyond. You know, you take someone who maybe has so much chronic pain they can't they can't have as deep of a meditative practice or an embodiment practice. Some of these tools might serve as sort of embodiment shortcuts uh, and not be all that detrimental. Um, I say this with the caveat always of we are getting to validating that in empirical research as far as safety and efficacy long term. Um, but in the short term, we're seeing a lot of you know progresses on these fronts. But for the purposes of this definition, just taking that in and again remembering that all of these slides, all this info will be infinitely available to you guys in the future. So we're just like kind of taking it in. But not all this is a 